Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Lila, and I am the events manager at Porter Square Books. I want to thank you all for choosing to log in and spend some time with us this evening. We're so grateful to have you here tonight, as well as, of course, tonight's very special guests, Terry Tempest Williams and Ariana Rhines. If you don't know us already, Porter Square Books is a community-focused, independent, and employee-owned bookstore in Cambridge, Mass. We're located on the traditional and unceded lands of the Wampanoag people. And the world gets a little bit stranger every day, but we are still here getting you the books you need. Um, so if you're local, come on down. We have a safe experience for in-store browsing. And we also have curbside pickup, local delivery, plus a bunch of shipping options. Uh, so we send out books nationwide. Check out our website at Porter Square Books to shop. And you'll be hearing this from many of your favorite bookstores and independent shops this season. But if you love us and, and want to see us survive these strange times, there's one thing that you can do that's really easy and that's just do your holiday shopping either. Uh, do, do it early. Our new saying is October is the new December. So just go ahead and, and buy those books and uh, stash them somewhere they'll keep for the holidays. That's what you can do to help us. Um, and you can do that in person or online. So I hope you'll also all stay connected with us by tuning into future virtual events. Um, just gonna mute that for one moment. There we go. Um, so we've had some really great events coming up, including um, tomorrow night on Friday, we're hosting Ken Quapis. He is one of the directors of The Office. Um, and his new book is, But What I Really Want to Do is Direct. He's bringing his friend Amber Tamblin to come hang out with us. So that's pretty cool. Um, it's free and open to everyone. Then on Saturday at 8 p.m., you can spend some time with us and some booksellers from across the country. Um, for Born to Read, Booksellers Talk Bruce Springsteen. That will be a really fun time. Uh, we have a ton of other great events coming up, so stay tuned by checking out our website or subscribing to our events newsletter, and we hope we'll see you all again. So just a few quick housekeeping notes, and then we can get started. Um, so first of all, this event is recorded, so you can watch it back. If you can only stay for part of tonight's talk or if you want to share it with a friend, uh, it'll be right here at this Crowdcast link for you as well as on our YouTube page. We've got this lovely chat window open on the bottom right of your screen. Many of you have discovered it already um, where it says say something nice. So please do and you can type there and say hi or maybe where you're watching from. Um, of course, we do expect you to keep it respectful as I'm sure you all will, um, but we do reserve the right to remove anybody who's not maintaining that standard. Right next to that little chat box down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see uh, the words ask a question and you can type in there or in the chat. I'll move them over for you. Uh, any questions for Terry or Ariana and we'll have some time towards the end of the event to take a look at those. This is also live streaming to YouTube. So hello, YouTube. And just so you know, we can't see your questions on YouTube. So if you do want to participate, just come join us right here on Crowdcast. The link is in the video description. Finally, I want to call your attention to this very good looking green button sort of in the middle bottom of your screen. It says order erosion from Porter Square Books. And that is indeed where you can purchase your copy or copies right from our website. So please do pick up a copy of this wonderful book tonight and support Terry in the store. Again, it would be a really good holiday pre present. Okay, I promise that is most of what I have to say and we are almost to the good stuff. Um, so tonight, we're so pleased to welcome the brilliant Terry Tempest Williams for the paperback release of Erosion, Essays of Undoing, joined in conversation by the equally wonderful Ariana Rhines. When Erosion was released in hardcover last fall, it received rave reviews from such institutions as the New York Times Book Review, Publishers Weekly, and the Minneapolis Star Tribune. It landed on many best of 2019 lists at the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, and others. Uh, the thing about Erosion, though, is that these are essays that really linger and last and even grow between readings. And that's why my very smart colleague, Kate, nominated this book as her staff pick of the year. Uh, in her nomination, Kate wrote, this was a year of extraordinary books, and I put a lot of thought into what my pick of the year would be. Ultimately, this is the most important book I could share with you all. Those of us who love deserts and mountains know Erosion can be a dramatic force for change, simultaneously destructive and creative. As we live through this era of significant change, personal, political, environmental, Terry Tempest Williams' writing is a spiritual bomb and a passionate call to action. So thank you to my colleague Kate for those wonderful words that really do express how we feel about this book. Terry Tempest Williams is the award-winning author of 
The Hour of Land, a personal topography of America's national parks, refuge, an unnatural history of family and place, finding beauty in a broken world, and when women were birds, among other books. Her work is widely taught and anthologized around the world. A member of the Academy of, of uh, sorry, of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, she is currently the writer in residence at the Harvard Divinity School and divides her time between Cambridge, Mass, to our great benefit, and Castle Valley, Utah. Ariana Rhines is a poet and Obie winning playwright. Her newest collection, A Sand Book, won the 2020 Kingsley Tufts Prize and was long listed for the National Book Award. Rhines has created performances and projects for the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, the Whitney Museum, Stuart Shave Modern Art, Le Mouvement Biel Bien, and has taught and performed around the world. She is founding Honcho and stewardess of Invisible College, a space for poetry and theological research. So Terry and Ariana, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. And I'm going to turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Lila. And I just want to say how much I love Porter Square Books. Um, when Brooke and I are in Cambridge, it is our home bookstore. I can't tell you the, the nights we've spent there um, browsing, buying, and appreciating what is there. I also want to really acknowledge the staff. And Kate, a fellow Utah, thank you for that beautiful um, comment. And Marika and Dina. So. And my young friend, Addie, who is an intern there. So it really is family. And to so many friends who are joining us tonight and colleagues, um, I miss you. And Ariana, I just have to say, this is a dream. I am so nervous. I haven't been able to do anything today except for just sit outside with my cat purring. And um, I miss you. And thank you for having this conversation tonight. <laughs> Do you have- um, Hey, Ariana, this is Lila. I think you might have two windows open and that's what causing the echo effect. So just double check that you only have one window open. Is that better? Yeah. Sorry, everyone. I, I, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be me if I didn't like break my computer at the very beginning of this event. So. <laughs> and Ariana, I just have to tell you, you know, I could have picked anyone to have this conversation and I just, I have learned so much from you. Um, and I remember the moment we met and how my perception of the world changed. We shared a class together. Um, I remember, was it called a Hagiosaurus that you took us? Not Chronosaurus. Well, Chronosaurus. I know it was crone or hag or yeah. and when you talked about you just wanted to sleep inside her for years, I thought, I love this woman. And Sandbook has been so important to me. It's a companion. I think that last part, Mosaic, really is a channeled piece of brilliance. And there, there are poets who give you lines to live by. And your line for me is to be of this world and no other. And I just want to thank you um, for who you are, for all of us. Thank you. Terry, um, I should just say for everyone, um, I'm, I met Terry in Cambridge at Harvard Divinity School and, um, and had known her voice and her work before coming there. But those of you who are tuning in from Massachusetts know what a different world Cambridge is from the, the kind of world that Terry bears witness to in her writing. And when I met you, I felt like um, you're one of those people on the planet I will do absolutely anything for, um, which is a thrilling feeling. And, and um, there's a, the, the, the dinosaur that I wanted to lie down in, that's a whole other story. <laughs> I was very depressed at the time and you resurrected me. So. What I love is that we all got locked into the museum. We I mean, did. that was like a dream, um, being told stories. Yeah, I, so, you know, it's, it's so, time and space are really strange right now. And it's wonderful that we're gathering um, at Porter Square Books 
even though we're not there. And I feel good as like a Massachusetts native to be part of welcoming you to Massachusetts <laughs> in some way, even though even though Massachusetts had already welcomed you. And um, and of course, this book came out last year. I have the hardback, and and reading it again this fall, it's it's a really really interesting um, sense of of prophecy and timelessness that that one comes upon. And erosion is a it's a, an apparently slow process, and yet and yet the the things that happen to us or the things that it does to us or that it um, reveals, um, those things are wild. Somehow this process feels like a kind of an unveiling. And the book is, um, it, it's an immensely painful, startlingly beautiful, and it just goes deeper and deeper the more you read it. And I'm saying this for people who don't know this book yet. Um, and I wanted to, um, I wanted to ask you some questions, if it's okay. I don't know. Are we ready? Are we like ready yet? Yeah. I feel so, you, you shouldn't have given me compliments like that because now I, now I can't <laughs> speak. <laughs> Um, thank you, Bill. I love you so much. I feel like we're alone here, but we're not. Um, as I was rereading this book, there were two motifs that really stunned me. And one is the eye to eye. You, 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 you face, you come eye to eye with a lynx, a Galapagos tortoise, a silverback gorilla with pronghorn, sage grouse, sage grass, with your brother's suicide, with your brother's undertaker. There, there is a practice of, of facing and of, of a kind of mutual attention with this, um, one of the tutelary spirits I feel of the book is Simone Weil and her writing about attention. And I was just, I found this so arresting, this process of facing beings and facing, I don't know what to call erosion itself, facing phenomena with this ferocious courage that produces really interesting effects and discoveries. And the other motif that I noticed in the book that fascinates me is letters, specifically letters to your father, but letters in general. And I wanted to sort of open, I just wanted to set the stage for our guests here tonight who may not know this book yet to, to sort of, the, for me, these were two of the pillars of the ferocious courage in the book. And I wondered about, I wondered if you could talk a bit about what it means to face things. You know, you and I are both at the Harvard Divinity School. And in the past four years, it has really altered me. And much of this book that is about my home ground, um, I feel like Mike Pence, there are flies around here. Um, so if you see one land on this white hair, we can laugh. But the Divinity School has changed me in the sense of a sustained focus about spiritual things. And much of Erosion was written while I was there, away from home. And when you talk about Simone Weil, it was a class I took from Stephanie Paul cell. And when I think about the gaze, and I think as women were so used to hearing about the, the male gaze, it's not that at all. Mm -hmm. It is, I took a class from Charlie Hallisey, and we focused on Shinran, um, a Japanese Buddhist monk from the 13th century. And he talked about the power of the encounter. 
And to me, that's what you're talking about. That's what that gaze is. And to me, that is a practice, but not a practice as something to do, but a practice that allows us to become. And one of my practices, and it's such a gift to be home, um, in this home ground, in the desert. I haven't been on a plane for seven months, and it's the most embodied I have felt in years. And I don't know how I can return to that other life, or if I can. I don't mean Cambridge, but I mean I don't even have the language. My practice here is each day to have that encounter. Um, today, the encounter was with a prairie falcon. And to, to literally be able to meet that gaze of this endless world of, of this 200 mile per hour being that I watched take down um, a dove this morning. It is a sense of awe or, you know, to see Orion last night um, and realize it is fall. You know, these are encounters. And I think when you have that gaze with another species in particular, um, because that's who my community is here. It's Brooke, it's our animal family, and it's these other species. Um, it's a rupture. It's a decentering. And I think that's healthy in the same way that I think the notion of erosion is decentering. And you're right, on one hand, erosion is a process that takes billions of years from wind, water, and time. On the other hand, erosion can be very quick and catastrophic. That happened on Saturday. Brooke and I were out planting trees and we thought a bomb had gone off and then a series of, of gunshots. And we looked up and in this formation called the priest and nuns, the nun's gown sheared off. <laughs> That's an image, right? Oh my God. But, uh, but, so but that whole shearing of sandstone came directly down and it was phenomenal. And now there is this white shearing that was once red. That has been happening all year long. Um, with Sister Superior, another formation, with um, Adobe Mesa, and another one down river. So I think what sounds like a passive act, um, a gaze, I think is a transformative one. I think one of the treasures of your writing is that the encounter is always reciprocal, and there's always a, there's always a surprise in it that something like you, you and in this in this collection you pass through kinds of desolation and devastation that um, there there are elements that that many readers can relate to but there are also forms of extreme heartbreak grief and mourning and loss that are that are quite um sheer or the the drop is really really severe and you continually find through this encounter which is not a one-sided gaze but it's really a reciprocated encounter something happens and that and it seems like that that something is what unites what is what holds the book in it in this um very charged aura um because you keep finding beauty you keep finding source and you never seem to give up on um the capacity to speak it and i'm very interested in this as well and i wonder i don't like one of the things that fascinates me about the landscape that you write about and where you live in Utah, and also the there's a there's a kind of vivid faith in in language, and I I find you again and again when you're writing to your brother, when you're writing to your father, when you're when you're somehow writing your to the Mormon Church, to to the American public, to this to the, there's this sense that. Um, all of this has to find its way through language, 
through you and through language. And I find it very invigorating because I lose my faith in language several times a day. And I have no words, <laughs> you know? So I think we're saying the same thing. Um, again, I think about Shinran and this changed me. I mean, I'm aware of how words change my soul. They change my DNA, you know, they become mantras. And this again from Shinran, um, after Dan's death from suicide, this happened. Now something else can occur. And that something else that can occur is, I think, what keeps us upright. And I see that in your work. And there is a line that I actually, when I was reading, I think it's in Sandbrook, um, it was after Dan died, and I put it on my desk, and it's this. I think you're talking about your mother. I felt I was sitting with a shamed and ruined God. I don't know why I thought that was your mother, but I felt like that was Dan too, because I felt like while Dan was alive and he's still alive in me, he was this imperfect God. And I think you and I share that, you know, that it's out of this chaos comes these perfect moments. And every once in a while you find a sentence that that carries you forward. And I don't know about you, but I think if I couldn't write, I would be dead. Do you feel that? I sure do. It embarrasses me sometimes. Like, I used to think that sounded like romantic or something, but the more, the more I live, the more I'm almost embarrassed by that fact. Like, it's such a fact that it embarrasses me. And it's interesting because there's a kind, like sometimes I think I've given up on the idea of anybody ever really knowing me, but it's because I have, because I'm familiar with this space that I only know through writing where I feel like I come as close to that being possible as I can get. Do you know what I mean? And I, I think when I was, younger and more romantic. I liked the idea of being known. I liked the idea of being understood. And I think maybe writing had something to do with that then. But now that I'm like old and free, <laughs> I don't care if nobody ever understands me because there's a kind of witness that's, that's somehow like the reciprocated gaze that I find in your writing that it, it's, it's kind of the only thing that I trust or something. And that was a question I had for you is what do you trust? You know, especially now where in this pandemic, we've all been brought home and to our knees. And, you know, I think, I don't know about you, but I feel like if anyone is fine, they're dead to the world. And what I mean is, I think this is such a, a difficult time. You know, we're living with a virus that could kill us and the people we love. We can't touch one another. Um, we can't see each other. We're in a moment of racial injustice and awakening um, and police brutality. We're watching 5 million acres of beloved lands burn. And we're watching our democracy unravel. And I think this is this moment of both reckoning and awakening, that we are both eroding and evolving at once. I trust this, even, even as we burn, I trust this. What are you trusting these days? The line of yours that's been like with me all day is, I smell the wound and it smells like me. And it's from, it's from um, the Tellurian. I never know how to pronounce that word. The Telluric, the Tellurian, Tellurian, mm -hmm. Tellurian. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think about the smell of earth and the, like that old poem, Earth Took of Earth. 
and there's this um it's not that i want to say that the only thing i trust is the smell of the wound but the there's that recognition there's that recognition of this is like the way that we're formed the way that we're formed here I, I don't know i don't know i don't know how to call the northeast like i've been calling it like the deciduous world like this the kind of it's it's more moist it's more it's more dense there's less sky we don't we th we think that it's about us and what's wrong with us we think that that's what life's about, which it isn't. <laughs> and there's and so there's something about the immensity of all of this that um, that like brings me to the the relationship with the land that you have. And I have often felt so ungrounded and so without land and so without roots. And I, I know I'm not alone in that. And my search, like, you know, both Terry and I wrote, Erosion and a Sandbook were both written at exactly the same time. And um, they're somehow thematically siblings. Um, but for me, like moving through the desert and desertification was also about losing earth, losing the earth. And the, and the the way that that makes me crazy, never having had that connection, but then but but then certain miraculous encounters kind of driving me into a sense of deep witness and humility, and I think that I trust. I think what I trust is the immensity of this. There's a funny way that all of this has been. It's all been prophesied. For thousands of years, there are no surprises. The writing is on the shit house wall. We can smell our own breath through our mask. We can't escape all the things about ourselves we formerly would have been trying to escape with all the things we love to do and all the ways we love to distract ourselves. It's all here. And there's that sense that what the old prophets were talking about and and even what 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 the newer prophets were talking about 20 years ago and 10 years ago and 10 minutes ago here it all is, here it all is and there's a kind of um feminine ecstasy and surrender maybe i trust surrender maybe maybe i put up a big fight but all i really trust is surrender i i hear you on that um, this whole summer has been a surrendering to heat, um, to drought, to not being able to leave, and to stay. You know, and I was thinking again about my brother, Dan, and how I said something that I really had no right to say, which was, please stay. And I heard that over and over and over again this summer. And I, this time I heard it from the land. Please stay. Because everything in me said, I, I, I can't stay here. It's too hot. 113 degrees, 109 degrees. Our Mayor Doma, who is in charge of water in this valley, says, you know, it is plummeting. Um, the springs are drying. The springs in Indian country, in Navajo, uh, in the Diné landscape are dropping. You know, when we heard that the pre, growing up, that the pre-Puebloan people disappeared, they didn't disappear, they left because there was no water. And to actually be present for seven months in a mega drought, what that means, what that asks of you. Um, the only way that I could cope, and I think you know, Brooke found his way of coping and I found mine. Mine was to, to walk at night, to go night walking because it was too hot in the day. And as I was sharing with you at one point, you know, I felt like the darkness in me could be met with the dark, how to say this, the darkness inside me was being able to be met with the darkness outside of me. 
And in that confluence was light. That, that two negatives create a positive if darkness is negative. You know what I'm saying. It was a different energy field. And that in that darkness, where the darkness was being met, I could pull color out of the landscape I had never seen before. And, and literally was being navigated by the stars so that um, Saturn and Jupiter became eyes. That Mars, as this ruby emerging from Adobe Mesa, was, was a point of orientation. And the comet, you know, to be able to see the comet every night and this arc of, of the Milky Way, it was something I had not been home long enough to see and embody. And I think that's been the gift, that by staying, by not being able to leave, um, to commit, to surrender, even to drought, to fire, to heat, that they became their own gods. Um, and that has been humbling. And it's it's also been my source of greatest joy. This paradox that I think both of us live in, um, in the work that we're doing. It seems, I mean, in the Jewish tradition, we revere the witness. And I do feel that part of what that please stay, what that request is, and I do think you had the right to say that to your brother. And I was actually really grateful to get to read it in, in this book. Um, because we are, we, we are, we are asked to stay. We we're asked to stay and we often want, we, we want to escape all the time. I want to escape all the time. And, um, and I think there's something about that invitation that seems both too easy and too terrible to accept. And because, um, because we've been forced to accept it, the, it, it, it just forces us to go deeper. And mm -hmm. that's how this book is structured, if I, if I understood it. I feel like there's just, you know, layers and layers of sediment. And it, it like, you know, it goes deeper and deeper into the ground and deeper and deeper into the heart. And there, there is always more. I mean, the water table is dropping, but this is, we we are on earth and we don't know why and we don't know where we're going. But and I love that image of Kuan Yin of holding that begging bowl yeah. with her heart inside it. You know, and I feel like that's what's being asked of us now um, with our severed hearts, you know, to both give it away as well as open it. And I keep thinking of Jonah yellow man, um, a medicine person who lives in Monument Valley after Bears Ears National Monument had been gutted by this current president by 85%. I went to visit him and I said, Jonah, tell me how you are. What are you hearing? What are you feeling? And that's when he said, we have to go deeper. And I think about that a lot, just as you're saying, what does that mean? What does that require? What does that look like, feel like? And what are the implications of that, if we dare to go deeper, if we create a practice of not looking away, but but keeping our eyes and our heart open. Um, are we met and in what ways? And what is the energy field that then is created as a result of that? I love what you said at some point about once you have experienced revelation, you can't go back or you can't undo it or once you've seen something you can't unsee it can you talk about that because i feel like that's a really important point um i'm trying to get the exact quote a revelation cannot be unnamed cannot be unlearned because i think we're all in some way having moments of um flash moments moments of revelation in this pause that, in this planetary pause that is now becoming a place? Um, you know, I, 
the way I felt about revelation was a little bit like recognition. Like if you see somebody in the distance and you recognize them, you have that moment that you can't undo. You can't, especially if you're trying to avoid talking to anyone, which I sometimes am, you can't, un, you can't unrecognize your friend or your, you know, that it's just, it's a cognitive fact. And then, you know, some of the like most profound experiences in my life, one of which took place in the sort of four corners region that, that, um, begin, that erosion kind of begins in, um, it, it demanded of me that I organize my life honestly around its honesty mm -hmm. do you know what i mean and even though it embar even though it meant doing things and that embarrassed me or that i didn't feel capable of i just had to accept that that was tr that true that if that was true and it was then i had to organize myself accordingly and i feel Right. This is one of the reasons why I feel in like in siblinghood or cousinhood with the process that moves through your collection, because as the treasures of encounter reveal themselves, you keep moving. You you have to you have to live and move in accordance with that treasure. So Kuan Yin. And I and she and she or they because there's the different genders mm -hmm. of Kuan Yin. She mm -hmm. arrives in the book at a moment where a miracle is needed, but it but it, it's in the structure of how you've put this collection together that it's not like some heavy-handed thing. It just it the each encounter moves you into the next treasure, and you can't it's it's never unseen like you i i feel like part of the ethics that i see unfolding and one of the reasons why i and so many readers find such um such comfort but comfort but not the kind of you know cold comfort comfort that's invigorating and like pushes you into courage in this work is that the treasure, the the miracle keeps on occurring, but you never betray the miracle. And that's the desert. I really mm -hmm. think that's the desert. It's that there's no place to hide. And you have to meet the desert on its own terms or you die. It's good and, to have no place to hide. Yeah. And especially now, I have to say, I truly mm -hmm. have gone feral. Um, I mean, you and I have talked about that and what does feral art mean and whatever, you know, I feel like as a writer, I truly don't, I can't say I don't care, but I'm not interested in what other people think. You know, I, I need to write what I need to write and it may not make sense. Um, I may be killed for it metaphorically canceled whatever happens in this culture right now but i feel like we've got to have the hard conversations we've got to be able to go into the those spaces of, of mistakes and awareness and chaos and be comfortable in that chaos and that's where i am and i find that i'm most comfortable writing letters as you say um to people i love and trust and also writing and I have found I've just been burying poems again you know that if I can just get them to the roots of sage that's enough for me um and that is liberating and maybe that's the gift of age maybe that's the gift of being home maybe that's the gift of not being in motion maybe it's the gift of feeling the sorrow of the world um maybe it's the grief that we're carrying of as a nation, not mourning consciously together, you know, 214,000 fellow citizens when we made a religion out of September 11th, you know, what is the price we're paying for this? And 
recently I was asked to write an obituary for the land and it was such a stunning, breathtaking moment. And it was, I was asked by a younger person that I really love that I've been taking night walks with. And she said, can you do it in an hour? And, you know, my pre-pandemic self would say no, but this is what we're called to do. And what I realized is when that sentence came, I will never write your obituary because even as you burn, you are dropping seeds, forests will rise and the world will continue. I realized I was writing our obituary and that I think uh, that we are dying and maybe that's a good thing, meaning that we're dying to the old ways of being. And in that sense, I, I find deep gratitude that our undoing may in fact be our becoming. If, if we stay, if we stay with the troubles, as Donna Haraway says, and find another way of making kin. I'm so sorry I interrupted you. I, I wondered whether you would read for us a tiny bit if you want to before we open it up for questions. You know, I, I was going to start with, I was gonna read something about God because you and I are at the divinity school and I know we struggle with that. And, you know, I was thinking, what am I doing at divinity school when my gods are bluebirds, you know, and meadowlarks and collared lizards. Um, but I think we should just open it up. Okay. Because I think you and I share that. And I think both of us are both tied to our, our cultural roots of Judaism and Mormonism, but we've also left them. And I think that we have a certain kind of faith and belief in institutions, but we also, um, are destroyed by them, you know, or I'll speak for myself. I love that you have started the Invisible College. And for those of you who are listening, I hope you'll take a look at what she's doing. I mean, to me, it transcends Harvard. And I think that, you know, this is another kind of erosion, the erosion of the institutions we've always prized. And I think what you're saying is, let's create an invisible college that is not invisible or a college, but it's a truth-telling enterprise, a truth-telling encounter. So, um, Let's open it up. Thank you. I don't even know what time it is. Yeah, we've got some time. We're we're right on time. Yeah, we have we have some good questions here, but um, folks who are who are watching, feel free to keep them coming. We'll just keep going through as as, um, as they come. Um, so uh, why don't we start with this question from um, Sweetwater, which says uh, to, to Terry, um, overall, you seem to be an optimistic person. So are you and how do you stay positive? Thank you, Sweetwater, for saying that. Um, hope isn't really in my vocabulary. Um, Ariana and I have talked about that, but I was reading the Dictionary of Undoing by John Freeman. And his, I looked up his definition of hope and I thought it was really fascinating. He said, hope is an energy field. That I do believe. And, and that was one of those moments where I thought, huh, you know, I'm, I have a, a great deal of faith. And faith to me is about engagement. Faith is tied to action. Um, hope, I think is tied to desires and I'm not sure I trust my desires, but I think it need not be about hope, but I think it's important to know where hope dwells. And for me, hope always dwells in relationships, relationship to the land, relationship to each other, relationship to our body, um, relationship to truth, uh, relationship to doubt. That's where my hope is anchored. That's where my hope dwells. I think of Emily Dickinson in Possibilities. That's a beautiful answer. 
Um, so we have another question here from uh, Juliet, and it sort of harkens back to a, a bit earlier in the conversation, which I think is interesting. Um, well, anyways, so she writes, is witness a form of surrender? And and maybe how is that in context with, um, you know, your, your conversation about, about revelation and revelation and witness? Are those related? Ariana. Um, thank you for that beautiful question and thank you everyone. Um, I, I think that's a really subtle, interesting question. I think I, I've never thought of that before, that that surrender and witnessing are connected, but I think you're right, they are. I think part of witnessing um, has to do with not, you, you, you have to give testimony not to what you thought you might see, or what you wanted to see, or what you wanted to know, but what happened, what actually happened. And it does, um, it does make for this really humbling and sometimes even humiliating experience of having to evacuate yourself um, and truly face, truly meet the gaze of what is before you. And I think that actually to witness to bear witness does require total surrender. And I never thought of it that way. So thank you for that eloquent question because I think you're absolutely right. And I think somehow for her revelation to take full possession of, of me, like I, I thought a lot about this because I'm I'm the same kind of ignoramus as anybody else. I, I've been poisoned by the same cartoons and you know, I was raised on television and candy, the same as everybody else who's my age. And like, you know, and and so and I also so I also have the same bad ideas about what life is, and I also have the same desire to escape what's true or what's difficult as anybody else. I'm not like like the Arnold Schwarzenegger of like difficult experiences or something, even though I do a lot of reps and I like really try to like to face it. But I think that um, when I when I've thought about how in the old books these things happen and these things were revealed and because they were revealed, the ones who carried that testimony who put it into language they would not abandon that fact and we live in a time where we think everything should be repeatable like we should all be able to watch this conversation again or everything should be able to happen again and again or i should be able to pay for it again or buy another one if i break it or something but but revelation maybe only needs to happen once but what it does to you your whole life, that's up to you. And I do try to be honest to that. I also would add that I think bearing witness, as, as you were saying, Ariana, is not a passive act, but an act of conscience and consequence. And I would even go so far as to say, bearing witness creates a consciousness that we can't even know how what we are witnessing is transforming us. And it goes back to that notion of staying, staying with the trouble, staying with the beauty, um, not walking away, not averting our gaze, but staying with something. And I think that's that kind of sustained focus that witnessing requires or writing requires um, is a definition of courage because you don't know what the outcome is going to be and that's a risk and maybe that's what we surrender to is the risk the risk of eroding and evolving at once the shearing
We have um, a question here that's actually for um, for both of you. Uh, Janet says that uh, they're infinitely curious about writers' processes. Um, so would you both talk a little bit about what the act of writing is like for you? Um, you know, before the pandemic, I would say I was a binge writer. Um, I did everything I could to avoid it. And I was grateful for deadlines. And maybe that's because I've always had a day job. And so I would work over time to have a three week period. And that's when I would write. But since I've been home, I'm writing every day. And I'm aware of the emotion that's coming up as I say that. Um, and I'm grateful for it. And I have organized myself around, because we don't know when this is going to lift, that it is no longer a pause, but a place. Um, I've organized myself around the cycles of the moon. So I give myself assignments from full moon to full moon and check in at new moon. And that has been really powerful. And I think, again, it's when you aren't in motion, um, there's a settling of the soul that has come to me. And I'm writing. Ariana, how about you? Before I answer, I just want to say that one of the things that I love about you is the way you cry. Maybe it's the drought. <laughs> it's not. You, know. you cried <laughs> last year, too. And, oh, and, and I, I love it so much. It's, um, it's water in the desert. I really believe, I really believe that that's the first water in the desert was sincere tears. I don't, I, I think, I think a lot comes from that and I adore it. And, um, sorry, that was, you know, you say things you wouldn't say when you're just alone in the attic. Um, my process, um, I, I've, I also am doing a lot of things timed with the new and the full moons. Um, and I have found that the more that I time my life and tune my life to the moon, um, the, the, the more I am able to um, somehow, the other puzzle pieces that often don't fit together, fit together. Um, for me, sometimes, um, I'm haunted and I am waking up in the middle of the night or I can't go to sleep or I can't live with myself or I'm just, it's, it, it's not always a comfortable process. Um, and other times I feel very inspired and lots of things are flowing out of me and they um, aren't necessarily any good. One of the things I worried about with the pandemic was that um, without the world to write against, I would lose my sense of tone or like traction or shape because I, my process used to be basically to like spiritually, like throw myself off a cliff or like belly flop, just, just throw myself violently into a state, but then know that the world would be humming along and I could kind of dip back into it when I wasn't a werewolf anymore with like, or like all sort of, emotionally demolished. And so I, I think I've been a bit of like a, like an adrenaline junkie with writing. Like I, I feel I have felt like that. And I've noticed that even in the pandemic, I'm still finding ways to scare myself and throw myself off of cliffs, but it's not this, this idea that, that there's an, that there is a world somehow that is agreeing with itself to flow together, that's gone. And I can't pretend, I can't, I'm not allowed to feel nostalgic about that because I never liked it in the first place. You know, like, so I've like, I've lost a little bit of what gave me traction and I'm still, I'm still a thrill seeker, 
but, but like the way that I come home or the way that I'm creating structure now is just as Terry is the moon. Um, somehow I'm, I'm constructing this new vehicle through that. I also want to say, I think writing is a transport, it's a vehicle of transportation. Like when you can't go anywhere, I mean, it is, it is a form of motion, which is very weird. And it's a form of time travel, which it just has a strange relationship, doesn't it? It takes a long time and yet it's faster than. And you lose time. Right. When all you have is time, um, that's how time passes. The poet said it. Um, you know, Ariana, I when we, you and I spoke this morning, I said to you, uh, for those of you who are joining us, we often send each other audio letters, which is quite wonderful. But the quality of your voice has changed in this pandemic, you know, and, and especially since the move. And I just want to acknowledge that. And I think it'll be interesting to hear, to see, to read how that physical voice change that I've noticed as your friend and sister um, translates onto the page. Are there other questions? Um, well, here, I'll, I'll give a, a bookseller preference here. Okay. Sorry, everyone, nepotism is real. Um, uh, my my coworker Kate says, um, uh, Terry, I was also stuck in Utah when the pandemic hit, and I felt that call from the land to stay, but also the call from within myself as she was viscerally reminded of her relationship to that land. And Kate says she struggles to find that here in Cambridge versus in Utah. And how do you feed that relationship when you are in the city? That's a great question, Kate. Um, they're different. You know, what I love about, and when you say the city, my mind directly now goes to Cambridge. Um, there's trees I've come to know. There's trees I've come to lo lose. Uh, one of the great oaks at the Divinity School was um, cut down. That was a source of great pain. Um, but it also tied me to that place. You know, I think you're tied to where your dead are. And that oak now is one of my dead. Um, so I'm developing a relationship with trees in, in Cambridge that I didn't have before. The ocean, that's a place where my eyes can rest because I need that. I'm looking out, you know, all the way to the LaSalle mountains at 12,000 feet. I can have that experience in Cambridge by going to Plum Island or to go to Cape Cod or Maine, you know, where your, your eyes can extend. But the Charles River, I mean, there's, you know, red tail hawks at the divinity school. There's, I'm missing um, the foliage, you know, the beautiful mosaics of reds and yellows and oranges on the sidewalk on the way to the divinity school. So you make your place, um, but it's a different place. And Cambridge, if I'm honest, is a life of the mind. It's not an embodied life for me. Um, the desert is an embodied life, but I miss, I miss the conversations with my own species. And that's why a conversation like this tonight with Ariana and with you, Lila, and those who are listening, um, I feel you. And that's important for our species. We're story creatures. And so um, there has been, I can't say a loneliness, but a void which is different um, for my own kin. So I think we carry different landscapes with us. We're, we're just about at the end of the hour, but um, I, I thought that maybe we could, we could end with um, both of you answering this very lovely question from Mackenzie who, who asks, what is currently moving you forward? Go ahead, Ariana. Um, I've asked, I've been making this prayer about love lately because 
I've been asking myself if I know anything about it or if I can love better. I've been thinking a lot about all the people that I love who are near and far. And, um, and the, the answer keeps being something very like what I find in Terry's writing and in this book. Um, and even in the timbre of your voice, Terry, and the grain of your voice, um, it's been asking, I, I keep asking and being told again and again every day to nurture, cultivate, be more of a farmer and a gardener of the love that is in my life. So what one of the things that I've been missing is the surprise and accident of just bumping into people, of, of being able to trust that life will just come to me if I go outside or whatever. That that aspect of being met by by sort of going out hospitably into the world, I've really missed. And um, and so what keeps me moving forward is this sense of, of wanting to nurture all the people that I love um, and to be more active about that because that is something I, I can learn, um, sort of not to passively expect the world to arrive to me. Um, and that's been a really, really great treat and treasure lately. Um, I think in triptychs, I think in threes, um, the first thing that's moving me forward is to vote. You know, I'm obsessed with this election and I'm terrified either way of what is going to follow because I think we're in an erosional landscape and I don't know what the outcome is going to be regardless of who ends up as our president. So um, that's moving me forward in this, how do we keep the open space of democracy open because there's so much at stake. Um, the other thing that I'm thinking about, and Ariana, I didn't even know I was thinking about it until you talked about love, and it's sacrifice. You know, I'm thinking about what sacrifice means. Not seeing my father and his partner, Jan, for Thanksgiving or Christmas. Not seeing my nieces and nephews. Um, and our son and our grandchildren because I love them and I don't want, you know, we need to take care of each other, which means to honor this virus and what that means if we don't gather as a family. So I'm thinking what that means and, and how to think about it in a way that is generative, not um, that is more than rather than less than. I'm thinking about that. And I think the last thing I'm thinking about is pulse. You know, what is the pulse? How do I keep my finger on the pulse? Um, Castleton Tower has a pulse. Uh, the earth has a pulse. We have a pulse. And maybe I could just read from this last chapter um, to close us with such gratitude, uh, Lila, for you, for bringing us together. Um, Ariana, my sister, for all the ways that you allow me to be feral with you um, and to be surprised by you and you make me braver because of, of your ferocity and hunger in the world. And I'm just going to read um, this last paragraph about health in the, the new chapter that's in the paperback version. It's called The Resonance of Stone. The health of our communities is compromised. Ravens see this change from an aerial point of view and not all of it is good. Open pits of toxic water, methane flares, chemicals from frac gas seeping into aquifers. We are learning from both science and the depth of indigenous knowledge how to listen, how to respond and respect and behave in the lands we call home. A fuller kind of kinship and rapport beyond our own species is possible. Flesh yielding to fur, bodies conforming to rock. The resonance of stone speaks to our resistance. The resonance of stone is the resistance. 
We are not alone in what we feel. The vibrational power alive within Castleton Tower is also alive in us. It is heard in the wombs of our mothers. Imagine how this magnetic field of feeling could erode the corrosive power wielded over the earth and galvanized an evolved power in relationship with the earth. Weathering change creates new forms of ascension, not without its difficulties. When so much is collapsing around us, bowing to beauty as old structures fall and new routes are found, is the unexpected gesture of surprise. Boom. Red dust popping through an inversion of clouds. Castleton Tower has a pulse. Earth has a pulse. We have a pulse. We are alive to a resounding world awakening. Thank you so much um, for this conversation tonight. And for those of you who have joined us, um, I feel there has been this field of, of hope that has been galvanized. This has been so wonderful. And I, I want to thank you both so much for just having the, the privilege of, of being able to sit in on, on your conversations. This has been a really special evening. And, and I do want to remind everyone to please do pick up a, a copy of the book. Um, you can order it from Porter Square Books right down here. It's this green button. Um, and if you already have it in hardcover and you already have it in paperback, then please order Ariana's book. Um, I'm going to put the link right in the chat for you, a, a sand book um, on our shelves right now. So uh, you can pick it up. We'll, we'll ship it to you with love. And, and again, I really want to thank everybody for, for being a part of our community here tonight. This has been really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Thank you. And this is coming your way. So <laughs> see you. Night, everyone.